Well, hello, Amit. I'm looking forward to chatting today. Thank you for coming on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Now, I always ask uh, the first question uh, being, what brought you to Treasury and why did you choose Treasury as your career? Yeah, great question. Um, I think when I look back, I think I'm somewhat surprised. Uh, I was actually at Sears and, you know, I'd done my CA designations, but I knew that, I think I knew that at the end of the day, I didn't want to be in accounting. And so I started the CFA program and just by fluke talking boss and there was a special project going at credit card business. And so she asked if, you know, if I wanted to be part of it and help the treasury team. I started in it. Um, I think I learned a ton early on. For me, it was just kind of jumping into the project. I knew it was about financing. I knew it was about financing the credit cards, but honestly, I couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. And so for me, I just think I was just completely enamored by it. You know, how we raise funds, how we fund the card, how we know how much to get. And then you start to learn more and more about securitization. And I think I was just hooked at that point and wanted to learn more. Securitization is a really niche within the treasury niche. I, I do love uh, that the, you know, the, any ABS type work um, is there anything specifically that jumped out at you that, uh, that, that you, know, you wanted to share with listeners around why that got you hooked? Yeah, I, I think it was just, I think from two aspects. Number one is, I think the complexity behind it. Um, I think it's, you know, you start to look at payment patterns of credit cards. Why is that important to investors when they're actually, you know, investing in those securities? Why do banks ask certain questions? For me, it was going from zero finance knowledge to something that is, you know, not issuing investment grade paper. Like this is like more complex. And so I think for myself, it was just on a listen only mode. When I look back on it, yeah, it, it's a thing everyone asks about. So if you are looking for treasury folks, it's what capital markets experience do you have? Specifically, have you done anything in the asset backed securitization space? It separates you. And I think for me to get that at an early age, it's not something I looked for. It was just something that, oh my God, it was just right in front of me and just kind of jumped right into it. Definitely. I just want to give the background um, for the listeners. So you started your career in big four accounting with EY um, for six years. You moved to Sears, as you've just mentioned, um, then in more of a, a retail reporting, but then moved across um, into the, the treasury, obviously. Um, and then moved across to, I'm not, I'm not going to say this uh, correctly because it's a little bit French, but <laughs> Descartes Systems, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Descartes Systems Group. Yeah. And then you, uh, you moved to GE Canada um, and spent 10 years with that business across Canada, the US and Saudi. You had a 12-month hiatus um, into the George Weston business, which is obviously a massive business in, uh, in Canada. Um, <laughs> and then you joined uh, Fidem Finance as the CFO. So I had a a stint as a CFO. Um, and then more recently, you've, you've been the last three years with ATS Automation as the treasurer. Can I just ask, first of all, uh, mainly because I, I hold GE as the gold standard, um, tell us a little bit about your time there and what you learned. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, uh, also I'll, I'll thank you for that compliment. And I think a lot of my treasury colleagues that worked at, at GE would think of it the same way. Um, I think there's really three big things that stand out about GE and especially treasury. Number one is I feel that GE really teaches you to learn the business. And so you spend a lot of time with operators. I think for myself, when I started there, I'm like, why am I spending so much time with the FP&A leader for real estate? You know, why am I doing plant tours at, you know, our aviation plant or energy financial services? You know, why am I spending so much time doing that? And I think what came back is, Ultimately, if you can understand the business as a finance professional, you can speak more intelligently about it to the bank, to bankers and you can sell the GE story better. And for us, everything comes down to cost of funds. And if you can understand that story, explain it articulately and clearly, that's what helps. Um, I would say number two is our operations are global. I, there, there isn't a market in the world that we don't touch. And I think really because of that, you tend to learn a lot more about global funding and its impact on cost of funds. 
And so, you know, you always hear the concept of tax efficient funding. Um, you know, we look globally, where do we want to raise money? What's the cheapest cost? And can we get it to where we need it? And so we don't just look at raising money in the US and funding something in Australia. It's let's look at every market. What is the cheapest cost of funds for us to get to? And so you spend a ton of time with tax lawyers. And so that's not something that I anticipated getting into treasury. For me, it was, it was all about working with bankers, you know, working with our businesses to some extent, but you know, working with tax lawyers is a big surprise. And then you realize the impact that those structures can have on cost of funds. Um, the third piece is really our diversity of funding. And so, you know, look at cash you generate from operations, that's one source, of course, but then you're looking to the commercial paper market. And, you know, that's what you're doing on a day to day basis. And then you're looking at the bond market. But within the bond market, you know, you're issuing investment grade paper, you're doing securitization, you're working with the rating agencies to see, hey, if I issue a 30, 35, 40 year, year bond, can I get that classified as equity? And so you're looking at so many different aspects. The cool part about it is you're linking it to an asset. And so you're not just raising money blindly. Sure, we write general corporate purposes, but we know exactly what those funds are going to. And so when we're speaking with the bankers, when we're speaking with investors, we're telling that story. And so very rarely do we say it's cash on the balance sheet. So it all comes back to understanding our businesses, having that close up alignment with operators and selling the selling the story I, I have to like i totally agree with you my dealings with ge it, it's really a financial structuring business behind it all isn't it oh yeah for sure for sure it, it's it's so much of just connecting with operators and learning how they're going to grow and then it's like going through your playbook of how am i going to fund it how am i going to fund it how am i going to manage risk um, where's my cheapest cost? You know, we have a close alignment with all, with, with all the treasurers across the globe. And so those were a lot of the weekly and biweekly phone calls that we had. And so it goes so beyond just the little country that you work in and you really make it a global business. And that's what made it a ton of fun, tons of stress for sure. Um, but I don't know, when you look back on it, you're like, wow, we accomplished like the list just goes on and on and on. I mean, that, that's a good segue into what have been your career highlights so far in your mind, Anna? Uh, my career highlights. So I would say that there's probably two things that jump out. Um, number one is having that global experience. And so, you know, working in Saudi Arabia, which is, which is a completely different environment than Canada. Um, and then also working in the U S and for me, you know, getting promoted and to do those assignments. Um, when I look back on those, like those were massive highlights. I think it's not just what you gain from the financing aspect of it. It's beyond that. For me, it's the cultural differences that you get on how to deal with bankers, how to negotiate. Like that's a fine line in a lot of different countries. Some countries view that as in, you know, it's an insult if you kind of look at their term sheet. In the US, we get a term sheet from a bank and oh, we'll cut it up, we'll send it back and then back and forth. But I, I think getting that global experience was key. So for me, that's a highlight that I always look back on. Um, the other area that I always point to is the operational experience that I got at General Electric. And so I was in treasury, I was in treasury for I think four, four and a half years and got asked to lead the finance team for GE Water Canada. I think for for myself, I never really had that true operating background and that operating experience. But I think it's one of those things where they saw what I did in treasury. Um, they saw how I connected with businesses, how I developed relationships with external parties, um, how I was able to drive the group forward. And I think it's those aspects that they said, yeah, that could fit perfectly in any operating business. And, and so, for, you know, for any leader, it's building a team, working with your stakeholders and driving improvements. Now you've worked across a number of different industries um, in treasury. How do you think treasury differs between those or, or doesn't it? Yeah, at least from my aspect, I don't think it does. 
Um, you know, as a treasurer and being in treasury, what you're really, really focused on is where's cash? What does cash look like? How are we generating cash? What's going on a day to day basis? And the experience at GE just taught me that you've got all these different lines of businesses, but all you have to do is break it down into what's our working capital? You know, how much cash are we generating? How are we managing our payments out to suppliers? And so for me, it's almost industry agnostic. Those, those key fundamentals on how you manage cash, how you distribute cash, how you negotiate with suppliers and customers. Yeah, that, that, that to me is the same in almost any, any industry. Every industry is different, mind you. You know, whether you're in auto, whether you're in life sciences, there's different payment patterns from your customers, but it all comes back to the fundamental principles. It's generating cash at the end of the day. And how are you gonna collect that cash and manage your balance sheet on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's just le different levers, isn't it? Like some, like you mentioned auto, it just means you're gonna be, it's a debt heavy business. You're gonna be a lot more in there like a GE. Whereas when, when you're in tech, it's a lot more cash flow and investments. Um, you still got the debt, but you're just mm -hmm. doing a little bit less of it. Whereas you're a lot more around cash and investment. So I agree, it's just different levers with different businesses, isn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. Like if you look at the auto industry, you know, those terms for suppliers are stretched. And, you know, what you have a lot of times in the auto industry is they stretch it more by paying late. And so, but they're consistently late. And so if you can get used to that, you can plan for it. And so that to me just comes down to forecasting. It's understanding your customer's payment behavior and then making the decisions behind the scenes. Because, you know, your CFO of the company is going on, want to release cash for capital allocation purposes. Totally fine, but you just got to plan for it. So when that day comes, you know that you've got the money in the account and you're able to release those funds. Definitely. What's been your um, experience around networking? How have you approached that over your career, Amit? Uh, so I started very slow, very, very slow. Um, I think for myself, I think it was, you know, started at ENY and I think it was just networking with that group. I don't think I placed enough value in it. And I shouldn't say that I didn't place value in it. I didn't even think of it as being an asset. So I thought of it very, I didn't think of it. That, that's probably the embarrassing way to explain it. Um, as I kind of grew and developed, and especially in my role at Treasure at GE, I started to get contacted. Um, I think the activities that we started to do with banks, um, the work we did on our credit facility, um, the amount of debt that we were raising for the multiple businesses that we had, I started to have treasurers reach out to me. I started to have CFOs reach out to me. Um, when we were in issuing investment grade paper, um, we were not paying the standard 35 basis points. We were paying less than that. And I think I just got a lot of questions from them on, well, how are you able to do it? You know, how are we able to negotiate it? And so I think my foray into networking started by people reaching out to me. And then, and then I was like, wow, this is, this is great. I guess you don't realize what you know until someone asks you for advice. And then from there, they became my contacts. Then it became, you know, quarterly discussions. Then it came quarterly lunches. Then it became monthly meetings. And it was just idea sharing. And then from there, it became, okay, what, you know, I've got a manager of treasury role available. You know, and so it became, you know, it became more cordial that way. And, and so for me, yeah, I, I think it was just sprung up on me more than anything else. And now I kind of realize maybe LinkedIn's helped a lot, I think, you know, kind of give you that black book that's online with all your business contacts. Um, but back then, yeah, I just never put that much stock into it. And I wish I started sooner because I think my network in the States uh, where I really spent the early part of my career would have been even larger and more valuable to me. Definitely. But you have to be open to it as well. Like you say, people approached you. Um, you were obviously a willing giver and able to help others, which really networking is. It's I, In my view, it's about mutually you know, sharing and, and forming relationships. So mm -hmm. you have to be open to that, which obviously you were. Yeah, no, I, you know what? I, I think it just comes from the environment that I had. Um, I, like I wanted to learn, I knew when I started at GE treasury, I had, I had a massive slope ahead of me just to catch up to my peers. 
um, the folks globally, the folks in New York, the folks in Stanford. I just needed to learn. And so I just started setting up meetings with senior executives, um, even if it was for half an hour. And I think the one thing I learned early on is that they love to talk and, and they love to talk about experiences. They love to talk about what they're doing. And for me, it just became a learning environment more than anything else. And so I think when I kind of looked at that experience, I'm like, wow, this is great. They never asked for anything in return. So, you know, I think it was one of those things where I just learned from them. And then I was like, wow, I want to be just like that. And, and you, you know, whatever it is I learn, I, I want to be able to pass that on too. And I think it's really because of the people that were ahead of me and helped me grow. Um, you know, when we were in Canada, we started with $4 billion in debt financing and we grew that to 18. And so I needed a lot of help. <laughs> and, you know, you know, that team back in Stanford, they taught me how to negotiate, how to speak to banks, what to look for. Um, you know, what do we look for in the marketplace when we're pricing a deal? Um, do we let the banks price it for us or do we come with a term sheet of our own? And, and so, you know, they, they taught me without even thinking that they were teaching me it, like they were just conversations. And so when that networking kind of reversed and folks were asking me those questions, yeah, I was, I was an open book yep. and I was totally fine with it. In, in a way, I think what you're saying there is like mentors and, and the, the people within your business have sort of indirectly uh, really had an effect on your career. Is that right? Totally. Totally. And, and I think the thing about mentors is, I think everyone assumes that it's some big formal relationship. You know, you're almost signing a piece of paper or you're saying it verbally to one another. I think it's one of those hidden things. I, I think senior executives just know when folks are genuinely asking them for advice and help and, you know, how do I navigate this situation? And for me at General Electric, yeah, there was a formal program and that was more prescribed through HR and whatnot. And that gives you a lot of knowledge, but there's no rule to say that you have to have one mentor. You know, you're going to have several mentors and there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't think they're only folks that are in your kind of pyramid up to the top. I think they're cross-functional. I, I think they could be in other industries. It's really what you have interest in. I, I would say that is really the hidden gem within General Electric or it certainly was when I was there, is folks actually had time for that. Um, I think part of it, you know, folks like talking about themselves and the deals that they struck and the things that they accomplished, which is great. And sharing that knowledge is just fantastic. So I think in order for folks to do that, you just got to be proactive with it. You got to be proactive. You got to seek it out. Um, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if people didn't have time for it. Um, you know, maybe I'm just lucky with the folks that I've had in my career, but yeah, they just step up and share that information. And I think a lot of times, a lot of times it does work and it does work beneficially. I think there's, uh, there's two things in that is don't be afraid to ask, you know, it, uh, your mentors. Um, well, let me say that first mentors to me informal is the, is the best. Everyone I talk to, you know, the formal programs are not necessarily where they get their gold nuggets. It's the informal ones. And then the second one is, yeah, don't be afraid to ask, like senior people, be it in your organization, be it cross-functionally, be it outside of your organization, are really willing to help. You just need to ask them. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it's, couldn't have said it better. Yeah, it's, yeah, even to this day, to be quite honest, like a couple of folks that I had reached out to early in my career and learned a lot from, they're retired now. Um, I'll still send them a note. They'll still respond. And, and so, you know, that doesn't die, you know, it, it, you know, matter where you end up in life, it, you know, if you've not nurtured that friendship and that common respect between one another, yeah, it, it continues. It's great. I mean, what's the, the best piece of advice, I guess, you have learned over your career that you wish you'd been told back when you were starting out? Hmm. Um, so I would say on a personal note, um, probably stay at GE longer. Um, not, I, I think for myself, getting more of that global experience would have been more beneficial later on. Um, 
you know, I think the run at GE was great. If it was a couple of years longer and continuing maybe with that overseas assignment, I think that really would have been, that really would have been key. Um, I think it's one of those things where you, you got to take a role that makes you feel uncomfortable. You know, your stomach's got to turn a little bit. And, you know, if someone's kind of put you up for an assignment, there's a reason they put you up for an assignment. It's not, hey, let's get rid of this person. I think they see something in you that you don't see in yourself. You know, that senior leader is at that position for a reason. And I think they know how to nurture people and whatnot. So I think it's really staying a little bit longer, but also doing some of those challenging assignments that you may not think are beneficial. And so I think that's, I think that part is really, really important. Um, so I think for myself, yeah, I probably, I think those are really the key areas. It probably would have stayed a little bit longer and done some of those assignments that scared me a little bit, that made my stomach turn. What are the key things that you look for when you're hiring your direct reports? Uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a very big proponent of making sure that the individual fits within the team. Uh, we go through annual, like not just the annual assessments, but we go through the real skill assessments. And then we're looking forward, you know, over the next two years, like what are we missing on our current team? And so those are, those are the individuals that I target. So I look for the shortfalls that we have, shortfalls in myself, shortfalls in different team members, and then try to complete that full brain. Um, you know, Google's done a lot of research on what makes effective teams. And I'm a big proponent of that. And so for myself, it's, I look for what we're missing on the team and recruit for that. Makes absolute sense. And are, are softer skills or subject matter expertise more important for you? Uh, so this has been a massive topic <laughs> in, in the last couple of years. And, and, you know, you always hear that, you know, let, let's get someone with the right attitude, which is completely important, totally important. Um, but for myself, it's really the treasury experience. This is a unique skill set. And I think first and foremost, you've got to have that treasury knowledge. Um, you know, you always hear that adage, oh, I just want great hard workers, bring them in and I'll teach them treasury. I think that is good. And there's some important aspects to that. But I want someone that can lift our team from a treasury knowledge perspective. I want someone that can teach us. And it doesn't matter what level you come in at. You know, if it's a manager level, director level, even a senior analyst level, you know something that you can help teach the team. So I want that individual to raise the team. So I think treasury knowledge is important. I think it's actually more important than those other skills. Um, it's not the 2020 thing to say. Um, you know, in 2020, we're all about attitude and hard work. And, you know, I'm not going to discount that at all. But if you've got treasury knowledge, you know what you're getting into you know the demands of what we do. We're a corporate function. You know, the best thing with a corporate function is no news. And so, you know, when you sign a big deal or, you know, you lower cost of funds, you know, you're not really gonna get that big pat on the back. You know, you're gonna go, okay, good. Well, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to drive down cost of funds. And, and so, you know, coming into treasury, you've got to understand that. You've just got to understand that's the makeup of it. And that's why we tend to look for folks that do have some exposure to treasury. That makes absolute sense to me. What do you think makes a successful treasurer in the eyes of the CFO, the CEO, the board? Uh, I think uh, two things. Uh, and we refer to it as taking stock and, look at, and looking around the corner. And so I attend the audit committee every quarter, a board meeting every quarter. And I think the important thing is to portray confidence. You portray confidence in your cash collection process, your relationships with the divisions. Um, you know, a big thing for us is past due receivables. And so it's knowing, hey, this is late. This is why it's late. We're on top of it. You know, we've got credit coverage for it. And, and so I think it's anticipating those questions that are important. And it's being prepped with those answers and knowing those answers. And so when we say taking stock and looking around the corner, it's knowing what is important today. What's important today is collecting money, paying bills, you know, managing FX risk. It's really the non-sexy part of treasury. It doesn't get enough positive credibility. It's, you know, it's back to that no news is good news. 
and probably shouldn't be that way because there's a lot of work that takes to make no news happen. But then what gets a lot of credit and a lot of attention is looking around the corner. And that's your strategic plan, that's your financing plan, that's your capital allocation plan. What are you gonna do in the bond market? How are you gonna extend the credit facility? And so for me, it's a balance between the two. And you've got to show your CFO, you got to show the CEO who's in those meetings and you've got to show the board that you've got both under control. You know exactly what's happening today. At the same time, you're prepped for around the corner. You're prepped for the CEO doing a large scale acquisition. You're prepped for an NTIB program. You're prepped for, there's a massive drop in rates. I got to recall my bonds. What's the MPV analysis of the may call payments and whatnot? And if you can do that and show that, that's what they look for. That's what, that's what I found throughout my career. If you can do that confidently and they believe your story, then you're good and you're golden. I mean, technology is moving rapidly, um, even more so with, uh, with COVID. How do you see the role of the treasurer changing in the next few years? Yeah, it's, the simple answer is automation for sure. <laughs> um, I think for myself, I've taken a very slower approach to it. Um, and, and I'll kind of break it down into a couple of different buckets. So for me, the one is just reporting, you know, getting my cash report every day, dealing with global banks. And, you know, you don't want to have your team log into like all these different banking systems to get reporting. You want one consolidated tool. So we do use a treasury management system. But within it, I didn't do the big bang approach of every single module. I'm like, I just want the basics. I want our monthly reporting to be simplified. I want our quarterly reporting to be simplified. I want daily visual management. I want to know what my cash balances are globally, by currency, um, by country. And so we've taken that approach to automate. Um, the other approach that we've automated is our FX trading. And so we use a platform, um, we, use, we use it through FXAll. Um, a lot of people use Bloomberg, that's what I'm used to using in the past, but they both work equally as well. And I think for me, those are the two areas that we've automated and we've automated well. And so the communication with the banks to do those trading, those trades daily, and then also what I need to help manage risk for me and my team. Um, the area that I have not touched is payments. And for me, Eventually we'll get there, but I don't think anyone can tell you what the solution for payments is gonna be. The banks have come up with solutions. There's a million FinTechs around the world that have done the same thing. And I think for that, I'm gonna use the archaic process <laughs> of doing ACH, which is kind of, kind of bizarre to say because it's so efficient, but I think there will be a solution for it to make it easier. I just don't know what it is. I don't think the TMS providers know what it is. I don't think the marketplace knows what it is yet. And so I'm just gonna kind of wait a bit to see what kind of falls out. And so automating that would be important because it adds a lot of efficiency. I just don't wanna waste, not waste, I don't wanna spend the money right now on it. I, I'd rather allocate those dollars elsewhere. And so that's how I break up technology in those three buckets. For me, it's reporting, I need that. There, there's no, there's no trade-off with that. I need to know where our money is. I need to know our debt capacity and our exposure to banks. Um, I want to make sure we can trade, which we can do. So I'm glad that's automated. But then with payments, yeah, for me, it's, I'm going to wait a bit. I'm going to wait a bit and let my treasury and CFO colleagues be the guinea pigs and let them come out and tell me what the best solution is. I think that's smart. I mean, it's moving so quickly that, you know, you make a decision today, it'll be outdated in 12 months, right? So yeah, I, I don't think that's a, a silly thing to do at all. Yeah, that, and there's a lot of consolidation in the space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of value being created. And so great work is being done. Um, I just want to make sure that I pick a company and you can never control this, but I want to pick a company that's going to be around and be a great service provider and continue to invest. And I think I think right now it's kind of at that early stage. So that's where we're going to pause. But the other areas we've automated and we've been exceptionally happy with. I mean, it's been a really enjoyable chat. Thank you very much for your time. I, uh, I've, I've loved uh, everything today and I look forward to chatting to you again. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate this. Thank you very much.